Yeah, very, very cool. So I want to start off this year by doing over the next few weeks some very foundational work because there's a few things that was true for me over uh, my holiday break that I think is just really important to get across. And, and the first thing is we were actually all born into a wrong direction in life. And uh, the word orientation uh, actually means wrong direction. Orientation means direction. So when we're not in the right orientation, we're actually in the wrong direction. And this is actually very, very, very important. All of us are born into the wrong direction because we don't have all of our conscious facilities online until at least six or seven years old. And so we're not actually fully able to, to understand and do things right, right into adulthood. So we get, we get ourselves in the wrong direction. And this wrong direction is coded into our society uh, because uh, everyone who's leading society that you look up to, they're actually in a wrong direction as well. It's a very fascinating thing to think about, wrong direction, wrong orientation. And because of this incorrect orientation, uh, many, many people you know, have a life of just so much struggle, uh, pain, disappointment, anxiety, just, just so much of that ill health, and unfortunately, from my perspective, they, they don't get to experience what life really could be. And so magnetic mind is a, a second chance on life. It's a second, a second chance on life. It's a, it's a chance to actually rewrite yourself, rewrite your story and put yourself on the right, on, on a different track. And so everything we teach here takes a while to assimilate to, you know, it's, this is, uh, this is the most advanced consciousness training on the planet. And many times in the chat box, I noticed over the break, as I was on the, the days of magic and everything else, I noticed a few things that were, were still, uh, you know, that, that people in the community that have been in the community for a while uh, are still not applying in their life. So I wanted to start with it. The first is, uh, and I've just got it here on my board. So I'll bring, I'll bring it down a little bit. Can I bring it down? Maybe I need to just bring it up, bring the... Is that better? Maybe I will just bring it down about there. Now I've done both. Now I bring, bring myself back down a bit. And there's a demonstration of oscillation. Anyway, so, so the first is uh, negative vision, okay? Right now, inside of Magnetic Minds, there is still too many negative visions going around, okay? And a negative, uh, a negative vision. So, so over here says uh, a desired reality designed to do something else, not just what the reality is. Okay, to solve how I'm incomplete. On this side, it says a current reality feels like there is something to do to complete or fix themselves. Negative vision has to be the sneakiest tactic or tool for the unconscious to ensure that you don't create uh, a life you love. It really, it really has to be right up there with the absolute, like, you know, the, the way that it keeps us uh, in our, in, in, in our current reality more than anything, negative vision. So can anybody here who's been in the group for a while, can you give me, uh, you know, an example or a, uh, a description of what you think negative vision is? So if I was asking, what is a negative vision? Uh, and, you know, you needed to, to, you know, describe it. And, and how would you do that? Just, just give me a, give it a crack. There's no right answer. Uh, well, obviously, there's there's more correct answers than others, but I just want you to say, what do you think uh, a negative vision is? 
Galit says, anything outside of true choice, something better than a current reality, something draining your energy. Yeah. Yeah, I like them all. I like all of them. So an, a negative vision, okay, is, is a vision or an end result that's actually based on how you think you're incomplete. It's actually based on how you think you're incomplete. So, for example, someone says to me, I want to be, you know, I want to have uh, a massive, a massive business. This is a, I want to have a massive business. So, okay, do you really want the massive business? Yes, yes, I really want it. Okay, what would it give you? If I had a massive business, I would feel like I had done something worthy. You see, is that the massive business was actually designed to feel worthy. And the only reason we would need something to then feel worthy is based on a current reality where we're not worthy. So this is a negative vision and it's very, 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 very sneaky. So someone might go buy a flash car, someone might want a bigger house, but it's all based on comparison. Somebody might actually just want to retire uh, and, and work in their garden and live off the land. But they're so scared to say that, that they go and stay in their, their job that's acceptable in society. Does that make sense? If someone says, my end result, I would, love a, I would love to have an amazing relationship. Well, actually, what you want is you want that amazing relationship to, so that you can feel love. You actually want the love. Does that make sense? A, a negative vision, most, not most, many people are still sitting in negative vision where what it is that they want is actually designed to fix or complete themselves. And the reason why this never works, the, re the, the reason why it absolutely never, ever, ever works is that there's always something else that you're going to need to fill that void because you've never actually stepped into the magnetic moment and had it all does that make sense you never actually you never actually be it see i was always somebody chasing chasing success and i would make another million dollars or or you know write a good book or get married to an amazing woman or buy my dream house or whatever it was or be in a movie with the dalai lama and tony robbins you know uh, i would i you know, finish university with distinction, played music to tens of thousands of people, represented my country in sport, like always. And every time I got there, I wasn't allowed to actually have what it is I was searching for because actually what I was being was somebody always searching for it. And so what you do, if the person is always thinking the relationship is going to give them love, every time they get to a place where they can have the love, their identity opposes it. Their identity opposes it. It's not allowed to be, it's not allowed to have it. So somebody who's always thinking, if I just lose 10 kilograms, if I just lost 20 pounds, oh, if I just did that, then, then I would be perfect. And then they get there, the next thing they're doing is, is searching up Botox for their face. And then the Botox goes wrong. So the next thing that they're, they're searching up is how to, how to fix the Botox. And then the next thing is, how do I get rid of, rid of wrinkles on my butt? You know, like, and what's the next? It, it's, it's always this chase, they never have it. And so what happens is, is they either just put more things out in front of them or they break what they actually have. And negative vision is very sneaky. I would put money that 80% of you right now have at least one negative vision on your choices list. If you're actually really true to yourself and you ask yourself, okay, 
If I was to do an audit of my choices, are these choices things that I love coming from a place of complete presence and joy and abundance? Or is this choice here to design to do something else? And and I have and I and I just it's just love. It's just it's just a moment of coaching. It's not, you know, we're all doing the best we can, but it's it's very important to understand this. That 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 it's it's very sneaky. See, if you have a negative vision, if you have a negative vision, what is the silent instruction you're giving yourself? And see, that's what's that's the key. If this over here is going to make you worthy, then you're actually saying you're not worthy as you are. You see that? There's a, you're actually teaching your unconscious something. Mm. So the silent instruction is, yeah, is, is that you're not it. So there is an antidote. There, there, is, there is an antidote to it. And the antidote is that you... Kate's asked a nice question. Kate says, what if you feel the motivation is add value to others' lives? Yeah. The, the, the truth is that it's a lie. The actual motivation is that it feels good to help others. So a really nice distinction. So thanks, Kate. Let, let's say that you have a, a business. Uh, or let's say you have a career. And your career, you tell yourself, is that you're doing this for to, to help everyone else. Just, just everybody here on the call, just feel that energy. Yeah, I'm here to help everybody else. Yeah. And yep, yeah, that feels like a good thing. Notice what you're notice what you're actually trying to do when when you're in that energy. You're actually trying to be told you're a really good, good person. Isn't it? You're actually trying to be told you're really good. Look how good you are. You're actually going for praise, isn't it? That's right, Ahmed. Yeah. So how about you shift it to this, Kate? Great question. How about this? I love the feeling of helping others. I am. I absolutely love the feeling of helping others. I feel really good to help others. So I choose to help others for me. I'm doing it for me. And just feel into that. Like I love the feeling of helping someone else. I am selfishly helping other people. How's that, Kate? I'm selfishly doing it. It is for me. I feel great going and uh, volunteering at the soup kitchen. It feels good to me. It's for me. Because that's the truth, isn't it? And see, when you're in the truth, then you can create that good feeling of, of choosing to help others. And you, you can be so self. And also, if it feels so good helping others and you get that intrinsic um, uh, feeling of good feelings, well, it should feel just as good to help yourself. Jacinta's asked, aren't you always going to have a reason why you're doing something? Thank you. Great question. In the old orientation, you always needed a reason to do something because everything was designed uh, in a way that if you did this, life would be better. But, but actually, uh, Jacinta, the, there's only one reason, and that one reason is that you would like it. You would like to do it. It would be fun or you would love it. There's, there's the only reason why you need to create anything is just that you would like to create it. There's no other reason. Any other reason, you're out of the truth. Does that make sense, team? Jacinta, does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it, you, you're just out of truth. Hmm. The truth is, is that you are a sovereign creator. You come into this world to create your body, to create experiences, and then you will leave. You, you, get to, you get to choose. It's very important to just realize that you get to choose it and have it the way you want and that it 
is your life. Anything else, anything other than that, you're just not in truth. And so one of the, the ways that we're mostly not in truth is we have de desired realities that are actually designed to do something else other than, than to have it. So maybe we, you know, we buy a new car, but we don't actually love the car. We, we love, we love how everyone's going to, you know, think about us about it, or, you know, we, we, we're doing this so that we are, you know, we're, we're more fit. We fix ourselves more, or we're not doing something as well. Like, well, I don't want any goals because we're actually so scared of failing or judgment. And so it's very important to first understand uh, what a true choice is, okay? So a true choice, something that you want to create, is just something that you would like. That's it. Now, I want you to think about your life choices to get the exact same feeling as this. Here's the feeling. When you sit down at a restaurant and there's a menu placed in front of you and you choose what it is that you will eat, that's the feeling of life choices. You're just choosing to have the pasta or choosing to have the steak or the vegetarian pizza. You're just choosing to have the, the, the Caesar salad. You're just choosing it. That's it. And then the universe or the, the wait staff go away and manifest it and bring it back. That's it. That's it. That's it. It's because that's what you want to enjoy eating. That's the same as what it is you want to create in your life. Yet too many of us put it because it doesn't, it's not anything else is we're trying to trick the universe or we're trying to create this. To, it's, it's just simply that this is how I would like it to be. And that's it. And then as soon as you, that's true, that is it. That is a true choice. It doesn't need to be grandiose. Like it doesn't need to be big. It doesn't need to be romanticized. It doesn't need to be puffed up. It doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be, it just needs to be chosen. Give me some feedback in the chat box. If that lands, like it just, it's just choosing it. And, and the reason why it's like that is because you actually realize that none of it matters except what matters to you. It doesn't matter what you choose off the menu. You are consciousness working your way through a human experience. And there's nothing more abundant than the now or better than the now. And if you can't have it now, you won't have it in the future. And so you actually get to arrive and experience everything right now. And then you just, you just pick and choose. Whenever we're, we're in negative vision, we're always coming from lack. We're always coming from a place of, I'm not allowed to just have it. So there are nine points of identity focus and these points of identity focus keep us oriented in negative vision every person throughout their life will live in three of these points in three of these points the first is a belief or understanding that there is something that is just not right about us that there's something defective and and that there's a way to be this is a very interesting perspective is is at, at some point there's a there was a decision made in the unconscious that the way i am or the world is is not correct and there is a way to be perfect a very critical view of the world this person will have choices or this orientation will have choices all about being the right way. A certain look, a certain weight, a certain intelligence, a certain ideal. Their whole focus is on finally being the right way. Anyone connect with that at times? The second orientation is an orientation of not allowed or not being 
allowed to be loved just the way you are. The second orientation is, is to not be allowed to be loved just the way you are. This orientation believes that they're not worthy just to be loved. This orientation believes that they need to do something to get love. They need to take care of others. They need to be good. They need to be this, be that, do this to be loved. They don't believe that they deserve love without doing something for others. This, this orientation is a, 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 a bargain with love. Interesting, isn't it? It's a bargain. They're wanting to bargain. Who always feels like that they need to do uh, something to get love? That they're not. That they've got to be right. This is this this orientation is full of obligation, and they get very unhappy when they do things for other people and appreciation is not given. This person is triggered by unappreciation because they're doing everything to be appreciated. You see, they're not just doing it to do it. They're not just doing it to do it. They're doing it to get the praise and appreciation and love. They're not just doing it. Does that make sense? This is the second orientation. I'm not worthy. The third orientation believes that there's something that they must do to be valid. Not get love, but actually be uh, be a, be an organism that's valid and successful in their own right. They, the, this the, this orientation is all about success and achievement in whatever society they're in. So whatever society this person is in, is they want to achieve whatever the ideal in that society is. Whatever whatever success is in it to them, if it's a you know, if they're born into a farming background, they want to be the best farmer. If they're born into a religious, they want to be the best at the religion. They want to be the best. And and it's all about competition. And if anyone else is, is better than them, they want to beat them. And, and this is a very interesting orientation, one that I've truly uh, lived uh, lived a lifetime and a half of and, and uh, was so happy to and happy to be be uh, letting it go. This orientation believes at the deepest core level that that without be that they are their success. Without their success, without their achievement, they're nothing. That's what this orientation believes. So, uh, sorry, the the first orientation, all of its negative, all the negative beliefs will be about fixing themselves. I need to be this way. I need to do this. They always get angry. I need to work harder. I need to, you know, go to the gym more. It's all about how they must be. The second orientation is about how they'll help everyone. The second orientation on their choices typically has, I want to do this for my kids and this for my husband and this for my community and this for that. And they, they're doing all of this, but it's designed that everyone then gives some appreciation and love back. The third orientation, all of their choices is about success. And, and, uh, and achieving things. I remember when I first first was doing goal setting, it would be, I want to make millions of dollars. I want to be, you know, world famous speaker. I want to, da, da, da. I want that. It was all, it was nothing was, was about anything else other than achieving certain things. And boy, was it painful. Okay, the fourth, the fourth orientation. The fourth orientation. It's a very interesting orientation. This orientation, uh, for whatever uh, reason, feels like they don't belong. They feel that that they are completely different to everybody else, especially their family. They feel like they uh, were, were switched at birth and that no one gets them. And... They really, really, really feel sad about the, this. this. This orientation uh, longs for a lost love, longs to belong, longs to fit in. 
and typically at some point decides that the only that, that they can't fit in. So instead of trying to fit in, instead of trying to fit in, what they're going to do is just be completely unique. And so this is the artist in the world. They, everything's about being unique. They don't want to be ordinary because they decided that they can't fit in. Fitting in is wrong. And, and they, they're very, very, very connected to their feelings. And they, they want to be an individual more than any other orientation. And so they really don't feel like they belong. They feel like they're so unique and out there. And so their, their choices uh, are all about how they're going to create unique things in the world. They want an absolutely unique spiritually based uh, relationship. They want to act, they want to have amazing art. They want to, they want to have a house that's different. They want to dress different. They want to, they, they don't want to be like everybody else. They don't want to be like everybody. They want to be different. The whole orientation is on how they are going to be uh, unique uh, and never ordinary. The fifth orientation. So there's nine of these. And uh, the fifth orientation is a, is a very good orientation. Well, they're all good. I know a lot of people in this orientation. The fifth orientation is an idea that the world is unsafe. And so they're going to retreat to their mind. The world is unsafe, going to retreat to my mind. And life isn't about uh, anything other than what they want to work on. They, they, they actually have the superpower of focus. This, this orientation in their choices list, uh, all they have is about stuff that they want to learn. Their whole idea is that if they can learn and understand enough in this world, then they're going to be safe. This orientation is all about the world is unsafe and I'm going to I'm going to learn. I'm going to understand things. And if I understand stuff, then I won't be hurt. OK, so so it's a very, very, very strong orientation in the academic fields. Yeah. Very strong. They, they just want to learn everything they can. The sixth orientation, again, based in that the world is unsafe. This is this becomes the rebel. The, the, the sixth orientation really felt unsafe in life. But instead of, uh, you know, feeling like the world is unsafe and retreating to their mind, they needed something to believe in. So they're looking for something to believe in. The sixth orientation is really quite a fascinating one. We see them in gangs. We also see them in the military. We see them in government. They want something to believe in. And all of their choices are about this thing that they believe in. Who's ever met somebody who's like this, where all choices are, are about, you know, uh, anything in their life, it's about their church or it's about their government or it's about their, their career. They, they, there's something they believe in and everything is about having people believe in that. They must believe in it. So you, you, you see this person, uh, you know, in gangs, in military, you see this person in, 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 uh, in government, in anywhere where there is rigid structure, they love rigid structure, and anywhere where there is something that they can dead set believe on, believe in. And if you try to fight their belief in the system or their belief in the way the world, they won't. The number one most important thing is, is that whatever they choose, it fits into that what they believe it. Yeah. They really, really want that. They want the world to be in a square box. They want to be able to believe in it. They want to know how it is. Yeah. They, you know what I mean? When I say they want it in a square box, they want, they want a, a worldview and rules, you know, like in the military or in a gang, we're the good guys. They, the bad guys, this person's in charge. I follow the rules. This is how the world works. They can believe in it. So fascinating, same, in, same in, a, in a church or in a government. It's the same person, just finding different ways. Does that make sense? It's the same person, a person that believes in, um, you know, that, you, you know, you get a job, you have a, a boss, you work your way up. It's the same person, uh, same structure, same orientation. Yeah. Okay, the seventh orientation uh, th this orientation didn't get nurturing the way they felt they needed it. 
And so they're actually terrified of feeling sad. And Christy's done advanced trainings. Christy is our resident uh, seventh orientation cheerleader. The seventh orientation is always full of enthusiasm. They are the energizer bunnies of the, of the world. And they're, they're, the reason why they do that is it's actually a defense mechanism against feeling sad. That's actually what it is. Very important it is to, to understand this, this person will have so many interests and be a very fast learner, have lots of interests, bring all the energy, lots of good stuff, but they, they never can stay in one place for too long to actually see something manifest. They jump, they bounce around. They bounce around. And so what, what you find with this person when they're doing their choices is they're continually taking choices on and off their list. They're never completing things because, because they never got the nurturing, they're, they're very, very, very uh, uh, independent and they had to nurture themselves, very independent, very much nurturing themselves. And because of this, any negative feelings, they learn to just ignore it, okay? They, they, they learn to ignore it. And the reason why they learned to ignore it is because they didn't get support, so they didn't know how to deal with it. And so they couldn't deal with it at age three or four. So what they could do is ignore it and go play with their toys. But eventually, the excitement of the new toy would wear off, and then they'd have to look at that pain again. But they knew if they just go found something new, they could go do something new, something new, something new. So anyway, this orientation is, is really fun to be around, and uh, then they'll, they'll go to their next thing. Very, very interesting. Yeah, interesting. So, so I definitely can live in that orientation as well. And, and I, I remember my father saying to a, uh, a, a university professor of mine on my graduation, he said, if you could get this boy to stick to one thing, I'd invest in it. And, uh, you know, you know, little statements like that, they just cut you deep. I still remember it. I was like, screw you. I'm going to stick to something. <laughs> So uh, anyway, the, uh, the next one, the eighth orientation, okay, the, the eighth orientation is, is actually a desire to be powerful, a desire to control. This orientation is very, very scared of weakness and vulnerability. Typically, they were around uh, maybe abuse or being strong was rewarded when they were a child. And so this person wants to have an empire. They want to be the boss. They want to be in control. They All of their choices about how they're going to do big, powerful, controlling um, things. And, and, and there is a distinct absence of any uh, anything other than big, powerful, in control. There's, a, there's an absence of it. There, there's no, um, you know, spending time doing self-care or connecting to, there's none of that. It's all about power and control. Power and control. They want an empire. They want to, you know, they want to take over. They want to dominate. Yeah. It's a very nice orientation. Uh, you know, my business partner, uh, Scott, is, is this orientation and he just loves being in control. And one of the reasons why he's a great business partner of mine is he, he can actually, you know, tell me, no, no, we're not doing that, which is good. Uh, and lastly, the ninth orientation. The ninth orientation sees himself uh, as a nobody. As a nobody. They, they see themselves in a little bit of all of those orientations. And... And this orientation typically just doesn't have any choices because they see themselves as a nobody. This, this orientation, they typically say, I just want to be in peace. I just want to have everyone just get along. And the thing is, is it's actually not anyone's responsibility to get everybody else in peace. That, that's, not, that's not your responsibility. It's, it's up to everybody to, to create that. And so 
when when the number nine truly starts making choices, then they can actually create the piece that they want to create. <laughs> but if they just sit there trying to stand back and and uh, you know wait for everyone to get along, they they find themselves very much um, frustrated. So hey, how was was that a good, nice little quick review of the nine different um, orientational points? Give me some feedback in the chat. So this is what my new book is about, by the way, and uh, it's understanding that none of those none of those are our superconscious, right? None of them are. And we can get ourselves so caught up in it, but every single one of them is designed by how we think we're incomplete. None of them, so it doesn't matter. There's no point doing a test trying to figure out which one you are. It's to acknowledge them and to notice that none of them are being super conscious. Super conscious is never dented, dented, uh, scratched or broken. The creative essence that you are, it, it, the God within, the higher self, the super conscious, whatever you choose to put a, a label on it, we all know what that is. The part of us that has our genius, our inspiration, our imagination, that part of us it can't be touched by the outside world. That that's that's that it just can't. So in that is your heart. In that is your heart. And when your heart manifests, when your super conscious manifests, the first place you must arrive is that you're not broken, and there's nothing you cannot access right now. Because everything you truly want is an experience or a feeling. So the first thing you must do, especially if you're new or if you're um, rebirthing and you're new again, the first thing you must do is live the core four choices every single day. You must love your life, live your truest nature as a creator, be healthy, and what's the last one? Predominant creator. You must live those. Okay, we've got we've got sessions on those already, so I won't I won't talk about that today. You must live those. Now, uh, second, you must have choices. You must have choices. There is no way for you not to have choices in your life and be a creator. See. The number nine orientation is the, the head culprit of this. They go, well, I'm already loving my life, so why have choices? Right? I've already done the I love my life one. I'm enjoying my life, so why, why, why have choices, Chris? What's the, what's the point of having choices? Why, why bother? I'm, I've, I've done the love my life. I've got my health. I'm living, I'm living, in, the, I'm living in the magnetic moment. I feel good you know, why, why have choices? Why? And the answer is, is that there's no way to not have choices. The absent or absence of writing down a choice is in it itself a choice. So you, you, you're screwed, mate. <laughs> So we'd say in Australia, you're just screwed. So you, you all, you, if you're not choosing to create your life, you're, you're choosing to just sit on the sidelines. And you must ask yourself, why would I be choosing to do that? And every single time you ask yourself, why am I choosing to have no choices? It always comes down to an opposing belief, an opposing identity made up of thoughts, feelings, and beliefs. Always. If you're not choosing to have choices, if you're not choosing, and the only choice you're making is to have no choices, what are you actually saying to your unconscious? That there's nothing else that you would love to experience? There's no one else that there's nothing you would feel good about creating? There's no holiday or, you see, there's no um, nothing you would like to learn or create or have nothing? Nothing. You wouldn't even like to, you know, choose to create an amazing, uh, you know, date night with your, you know, your sweetheart. 
you wouldn't even choose to experience going and, and seeing something. See that? To have no choice is, the, is a choice in itself that tells your unconscious that you actually think you're powerless. <laughs> Can someone please uh, tell my wife to stop uh, distracting me with uh, with little messages? <laughs> oh, there you go. Does that make Does that make sense? The the very important. If you you must have choices because you always have choices, but you much must, must have, so somebody who doesn't have choices. This is their life. They just sit down at the restaurant. Just bring me whatever. And sometimes they get food they like, and sometimes the waiter just brings them, you know, the leftovers of the table next door. And sometimes the waiter just says, oh, yeah, you're just on water. You see that? That's what I want you. Anyone here who thinks, well, I, I'm done with choices. I don't. It, it, that's literally, yeah, or Julia says, or just what everyone else is having, right? You might have an allergy to that, you know? It, See, so so something's going to get brought to you. This is the this is the the point. Something's going to get brought to you because time is always moving, and so it's about. You. So today's session, I really wanted you to understand how the recode works. Yeah, Catherine asks, "What if your choices are different to your partners?" I really do hope they are. I hope they are different. I hope they are different. That's very important that they're different. Uh, I think what you're really asking is, what if your choices conflict with your, your partner? I think it's very important to acknowledge that two people do need to be, uh, you know, in agreement of where each is wanting to take their life in order to be together. I think that's very important. Where each is wanting to go must, must work. So what if, Catherine, what if? Anyway, so... Here's how the recode works. The recode works firstly by you writing down and getting connected with choices that are true to you, that you just choose to have. This is very important. As soon as your choices are just true to you, your unconscious is going to make up all sorts of reasons why you cannot have that. It's going to tell you, you know, you, you're not smart enough or, you know, you'd be, you, you should feel guilty to even want this. Does that make sense? So as soon as you have a true choice, you say, I would really like a new house. Now, I just love it. I would really like to have a body that's this shape. I would really like to have a body that functions this way. I would really like to write a book. I would really like to get paid more money. Whatever it is, whatever's true, just I would really like a holiday here. Your unconscious being the helpful friend that it is, is going to send up warning signals to say, hey, that isn't the same as the past. Does that make sense? That isn't the same as what you've experienced. And because it's not the same, warning, 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 we don't know if we can survive that. Warning, we've never survived that. Warning, siren sounding, warning, we've never had that before. And, and, and we don't know if, if that is survivable. And so the recode first works by allowing this warning sign to come up because we get into an end result that then creates this warning signal to come up, then the recode allows you to rise above it and just let it go. That's what it allows you to do, just to rise above it and actually say, hey, unconscious, thanks for the warning, thanks for the coding. I know at age four years old, uh, gosh, th this, this would, would have been very different to my family, and because it was different to my family, you know, I didn't want to be different to my family and I thought I might get rejected. So, so thanks for the warning. But actually, I know that I can have this and still be safe. So me, I'm the super conscious and I'm going to put in commands to let it go. Does that mean I'm going to, and we're going to use commands to let it go. 
That, that's how the recode works. The recode doesn't work by fixing you. The recode works by, by living outside of the unconscious identity. The recode doesn't work by fixing your unconscious. It works by living outside of it, by allowing you to live in a different world, in a different direction in life. You see that it's not trying to fix the old stuff. It's saying that was useful. We now live here. This is so crucial. It's so crucial because as great as the recode is, if you use that tool to try to become perfect or be worthy or fix yourself, there's a second instruction that the unconscious will pick up and you will honestly screw yourself up more. It's really important to get that, that the recode works by allowing that which you want to manifest be present. That's what it does by letting go of, of your old orientation and living outside of it. And so as you make your choices, the unconscious will tell you how you can't have it. We rise above it. We let it go. And then we, we just have what's left. And, and honestly, it's, it's, uh, it, it's quite genius uh, what we have here. It's quite genius. And I'm really proud of it. And, and so it's very important to understand that, that as you choose and let go, as you choose and let go, the only thing that's left is what you choose. That's all that's left. And if that choice is a connection with your creator, then that's what's left. If that choice is uh, lots of money or a great life or uh, you know a nice house, that's all that's left. That's that's all that's there. There's nothing in the way. And and so we'll go into recode now. But if you're to truly master this work, really to master this work, you really want the magnetic mind. Mastery is not the absence of being triggered. Mastery of this magnetic mind is not an absence of being triggered. Many think that the magnetic mind, you're going to have this mind that never gets annoyed, never gets triggered, right? Never gets upset. And, 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 and that, would, that actually be called being a robot. You know, they actually tried it. Hey, they, they, there's a part of the brain, uh, I believe it's called the uh, occipital lobe. Anyway, it's a lobe just behind the eyes here. And uh, it, it's responsible for emotion. And so, you know, back, I think it was in the 50s, uh, they decided, uh, and, and a gentleman decided he didn't want to have emotion. He was a business leader and, you know, uh, decided that he would get rid of it. He, he, he would, uh, for the sake of science, he would, he would cut off access to this lobe. Yeah, it's the occipital frontal lobe. So it's underneath the, yeah, yeah, underneath the frontal lobe. Is it occipital? Anyway, it doesn't actually matter what it's called. They, well, it doesn't matter for my purpose of right now. And so anyway, they, they, they did, they, they severed it. And what they found is that in, he was unable to make any decisions. He was unable to make decisions. Without emotion, he was unable to make decisions. Because the way that we make a decision that I want to have a glass of water is that I feel thirsty. The emotion is needed. The, it, it, the, what we call negative emotion or the triggered emotion is, is actually needed to make decisions in life. So that was my last point that I wanted to make is that. Mastery of this work isn't about not being triggered or not getting annoyed or, you know, not having, you know, moments of frustration because that's what the human experience is about. And any coach out there that uh, makes fear and the unconscious and negative 
uh, emotions the enemy, you should run from that teacher and that coach as fast as you can because they're actually not teaching you to be a creator. They're teaching you to see yourself as dysfunct a dysfunctional thing that you need to fix. The unconscious has its purpose. It's, it's, a, it's a brilliant aspect of us. Well, it, it, it's not there to be fixed. It's needed. And this works about learning to have a magnetic mind, which allows you to rise up and out of that dysfunction and back into creation. Make sense? Very important, you know, and, and, and anything that tries to say you, you got to fix, fix or, you know, it's just not right. It's just, it's, it's sincerely not right. Anyone out there that's trying to heal you is really just giving you an instruction that, uh, that, that you're not allowed to have that feeling. And that you and the basis of that is you're not allowed to be. So uh, there's three things that as we come into this world, there's three things that uh, we want, and each one of them are the basis of, of, of it all. The first is the right to exist and be ourselves. The second is the right to love and be loved. And the third is uh, the right to have our needs uh, taken care of and to be safe. And if any one of those aren't met, we make up all sorts of ideas about why not. So uh, I hope that that was a very valuable uh, um, uh, conversation because, because it felt good to share it anyway. <laughs>